Assalamu alaikum, Ahlam Sahlan. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature, and in particular to this conversation, which I think for readers and any writers in the audience and the writers on the stage um, is going to be one of the most thought provoking sessions. It's entitled Hard Times Human Stories. My name is Julia Wheeler, and it's my huge pleasure to introduce three authors who come to think about this topic from such diverse perspectives. Barkadat is one of India's best-known broadcast journalists and a multi-award winning reporter. She's founder editor of the multimedia digital platform Mojo Story and a columnist for the Washington Post and the Hindustan Times. Barker's book, To Hell and Back, is subtitled Humans of COVID, which captures so perfectly what she's created within it. Professor Lucy Easthope is the UK's leading authority on recovering from disaster. She's advised on everything from 9-11 to the Tunisia shootings, from the Boxing Day tsunami to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in the UK, the fire at Grenfell Tower. Lucy's book, When the Dust Settles, tells the stories of love, loss and hope behind each of those headline-making stories. Joe Browning Rowe's debut novel, A Terrible Kindness, is a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller and was shortlisted for the Bridport Peggy Chapman Andrews Award. Its starting point is the 1966 tragedy of the Welsh coal mining town of Aberfan. Jo teaches creative writing at Cambridge University. She is an old friend of the <laughs> festival, as in the, the theme of this festival is old friends. Please, everybody, join me to welcome Jo, Lucy and Barker. <laughs> I want to begin by talking about the balance between the personal and the big picture in all of your work. And Barker, I wonder whether I might start with you. You say at one point in your book that you change from being chronicler of this story to protagonist. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. You can all hear me? Yes. So basically, um, I used to be in television and about... Three years ago, I decided to launch a digital platform uh, called Mojo Story. Mojo means magic. And the idea was to recover or reclaim the magic of storytelling. What I didn't know at that time was that just as I was starting, the pandemic would hit, not just India, but the world. So the birth of Mojo Story coincided with the arrival of the pandemic. And instead of being able to build my company, I decided to do what I love doing best, which is to set out and tell the stories of people. And in our country, in, during the lockdown, we had an additional humanitarian uh, sort of challenge because our poorest people who worked as daily wagers in our cities but actually had homes in the villages, because of the lockdown, suddenly lost all of their source of income. And they decided to go home because like you and me, during a crisis when it felt like the world might end, they wanted to be with those they loved. And they walked, in some cases, hundreds of kilometers home, uh, and I walked with them in many instances telling their story. This background is important to make all of you understand that through 2020 and 2021, my entire professional life was devoted to the telling of the pandemic. Out there, in the hospitals, on the highways, in the slum tenements, uh, inside crowded trains, inside ICUs, what have you. And I had by then started reporting on oxygen shortages, hospital bed shortages, which is of course something the world was dealing with, not just India. And then I find that everything I'm reporting on suddenly becomes my own life. The news literally comes home. When my father, diagnosed with COVID, initially treated at home, suddenly needs a hospital bed, and I have to pull every connection that I have, coming from relative privilege, unlike the people I'd been reporting on, but still begging, pleading, cajoling. And the hospital consents, but it's an hour away from where we live. And they don't have an ambulance at the time. So I decide to hire what's called a private ambulance, except when it arrives, it's just a broken down old van. Uh, it's got no paramedics, it's got a driver, it's got one big cylinder at the back which is placed on the floor uh, and I waver for a bit and I say, should I? And then I panic and I say, no, we can't take the chance, let's do it. And I get into the front of the, the van, my father at the back with an attendant and we get caught in these traffic snarls and while I'm carrying my father to the hospital, I'm actually filming this. 
I'm filming it because one, it's second skin. It's almost like an, like my limb, like you know, in the middle of personal crisis. Also, I'm filming that there's a traffic snarl, and I'm tweeting the chief minister of <laughs> Delhi saying, "Oh my God, there's no passage for for ambulances." We reach the hospital. He's supposed to be taken into a general room with his attendant, and the doctors on emergency duty say, "Hang on, he needs to go into ICU." And I say, "Why?" And they find that that one cylinder hasn't worked as it should have and his oxygen levels have plummeted. He's wheeled in, I have to beg again for that ICU, and suddenly it's like an out-of-body experience because I've been on the other side of the camera telling the stories of the people this is happening to, and now I'm that story. And that's the last time I see him alive. And as a reporter, I was able to get inside pretty much every hospital with consent, of course, but as a daughter, I, I can't. And five days later, he's dead. And we have to take him to the nearest cremation ground because that's the, that, those are the regulations at that time. And one of the other stories I'd been telling was how there was no space left to the graveyards and the cremation grounds, and suddenly there's no space to cremate my father. But in almost like an irony that belongs to fiction, the ambulance that carries his body has plush leather, sort of automated robotic seats, and uh, yeah, well, we have to call the police for help to get space to cremate him. And the day I cremate him, I come home with COVID, which I haven't got one and a half years of actually reporting out there. But the day I cremate my father, I get COVID. And then I'm like, the news has come home, and now what do I do? And I basically say, I can't feel right now, because if I feel, I'll collapse. So I start, I just work through it. Even when I'm home in my quarantine, I am in my basement, locked up, but just doing a show every day, because I don't want to process what's, mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my story. So sorry. Um, I wonder the, how long it took and what the process was for you to actually include that in your story and write it down because you talk in the book about actually there were times when you thought I can't finish this book because it, because it had come home. Yeah. What kept you going? I think one, the memory of my father who brought my sister and I up as a single dad. My mom was... Uh, you know, a path-breaking female journalist in India. I mentioned her gender because when she started journalism, there were no women in journalism. And she died when I was 13. And my dad pretty much single-handedly brought my sister and I up. But the other was the fact that I had a ringside view of history as it was unfolding. Mm -hmm. And my editor, Chiki Sarkar, reminded me. I called her at one point from London I, I, when, when COVID looked like it had finally halted or taken a break. I, at the end of two years, I said, I'll, I'll go to the Reuters Institute. I went as a fellow to write my book. And I called Chiki Sarkar one day just crying. I, I, I had postponed, I had postponed my emotional breakdown. Mm. So I suddenly <laughs> start having it. And this is something journalists <coughs> do. You just postpone it. Like you know it's there, you know you're gonna collapse. You're like, can I just push this down for a few <laughs> months? And so here comes the breakdown. Yeah. And I'm crying every day. I don't even know why I'm crying. I, strange things, I can't listen to music. I write about that in the book because it reminds me of my father. I can't climb up the steps to his bedroom. You know, I used to live across the landing from him and I can't suddenly write. And I call my editor and say, I can't do the book. And she said, I will remind you that you said in the first wave to me that if not even one person reads this book, mm. you said you would have to write it because it's a slice of history and you had that rare access to witness it. And so you owe it to a time when people will be ready to pick up this book and look back at what yes. they went through because you were the chronicler of that mm. time. Okay. And so and, I, I mean, thank you for writing it. It's thank an amazing, you. absolutely thank amazing you. book. Um, Baki, you talk about a ringside seat of history. Lucy, you have had ringside seats of the disaster history. Yeah. When you came to write When the Dust Settles, how did you approach weaving your own story, given that it's a memoir, into those big picture events that we would, as I said in the introduction, all recognise from, from the headlines? How did you create the personal because you want to tell your story and, and make a balance between the two, if you like? Absolutely. And I think the book that I always perhaps thought might be written at this time in my life would have perhaps been a, a textbook or a guide. And then uh, something in me changed, I think, particularly after the, the Grenfell fire and then at the start of the pandemic, very, very similar to what Barker was saying, um, that I, I too felt that people needed to uh, 
hear the story and when they were ready for them, the stories would be there on the shelf. I think that's something that unites us all. Uh, we would love you to buy our books, but if you feel you can't read them today, <laughs> put them on your shelf and keep them because I think it's that chronicle, it's that, it's that record. But I also felt very strongly that the, the people um, reading the book needed to understand me and what drove me and um, why I cared so much about the fact that disasters will always happen. The pandemic was the most known about and planned for risk in global history. And it still happened. And it still did all the things we worried about, which were not just about the virus. They were about how many nations, ours, absolutely united by the, the treatment of those on lower incomes. And so for me, I want people to get me a bit. Because if they got me, then they would understand why Everything mattered. So one of the first decisions that I, I made with my, with my wonderful uh, editor, Kirthi, was to not necessarily dwell on the definition of what disaster was mm. and have it on this spectrum, whether that's personal bereavement. Yeah. Um, in my case, I, we, I weave in all the way through. I'm working in my 30s. I'm trying to have children with, with recurrent uh, miscarriage and, and going out to families who are in the worst time of their lives after a disaster and reflecting on their treatment. And so uh, it was very important that the reader got a sense of me, but also that in my work, because I go from disaster to disaster, there is also joy and love, and you needed to understand who I loved and how I was joyful. So the book isn't just about disaster, it's very much about life and living. And that actually is an important part of the, the recovery side of absolutely. things, isn't it, that you bring yeah. out? Yeah, absolutely. So you need to see the, the full thing, otherwise it was just a, a, a pretty uh, sort of almanac of misery. And that, yeah. no, no. <laughs> that was going to be quite a hard read. No, I mean, in both of them, for wonderful reasons and terrible reasons, there is certainly a narrative arc. Um, which brings us to your novel, Jo. Um, you're in this book in a... In a different way it is fiction but uh, tell us a little bit about it and um, also your early life where you grew up because yes. I think that's important for us to understand yes okay well I'll start with the story and how I came to tell it basically I was researching a completely different idea um, and that um, required me to be reading the conference paper notes for 1966 of the umbrella organization of all the undertakers in the, the UK so there's obviously a bit of a theme for me here um, but anyway, I came across by accident an account of one man who had coordinated all the embalmers who had gone to help at the Aberfan disaster, which was when, um, in a small Welsh village, um, a, a waste coal tip had collapsed down the mountainside and buried the village school, killing over 100 children. So just terrible, terrible disaster. Um, and, and I read this account of how this young man, who was only in his 30s, an Irish um, embalmer, had... Um, had coordinated these efforts and got people to come from all over the country, um, including sending um, a telegram to a dinner dance that was happening in Nottingham, which isn't that far away from, from what this place in Wales, um, where they were all having their dinner dance. And he knew there was lots of them there in one place, so he sent a telegram and said, please come and help. And so some men got in their cars and drove down. And so I then interviewed this one embalmer, um, I've got to stop myself from telling the whole story, but I interviewed him, and he, he said to me, his opening sentence, we, we sat in the airport cafe, because he was in Northern Ireland, and his opening sentence to me was, you should leave Abervan well alone. Um, and I thought, well, I've come all this way, and he's obviously willing to meet me, so I said, well, can you just tell me about what you did? And he said, we didn't talk to anyone. I haven't talked to anyone about this since I left, and this was over 40 years ago at the time. Um, and, and I said well, will you just tell me about what you did? So he started talking, and four and a half hours later, he stopped talking and said, maybe this story could be told. And so that's why I told the story, but it was very much from the point of view of an outsider going in to help and the impact that had on his life. So my character, we see what he did before the disaster. He's a choir boy in Cambridge, trainee in Barmer, then went to help, and then follow him through his life because he has what we now know to be PTSD and how he lived with it and dealt with it. And it ends up with him going back to Aberfan to find some sort of resolution. We should also say that you grew up yes. in, a, in a crematorium in Birmingham. In Birmingham, yes. Right. And I think, just very briefly, I think what happened with me then when I came across this story of the embalmers of Great Britain, for some people, 
it would be a, a bit of a... Whereas for me, I kind of lent into it because although I hadn't known embalmers very well, I had known the undertaking profession and I recognised them to be a very dutiful, respectful, kind um, group of people. And so there was something in me that felt like I was sort of going home in talking about mm. it. You touch on something really interesting there about permission to write this story. He's saying you, you should leave Abafan well alone. <sighs> How did you give yourself permission to write this story? You're, you're not Welsh, you weren't there at the time, yeah. and it is still, you know, when people in the UK talk about Aberfan, it's you know, it's still yes. there, isn't it? Yes, I think th there was a few things. First of all, him saying that, I didn't, I always say, it wasn't like it was a blessing, but it, it was sort of made me think I can have a go. Mm -hmm. um, and also I felt I would never have even thought about trying to write the story from the point of view of somebody in Aberfan. But the idea of writing it from somebody from the outside who comes in mm -hmm. and goes again felt easier. I did, I visited Aberfan, I, I showed the relevant passages to, um, to somebody who'd grown up in Aberfan and he said, would you like me to show it to one of the survivors? And so I said, yes, please. So they read it. They didn't want to meet me. They didn't want to be quoted. But they said they, they felt that it was a, a fair representation. So mm. I sort of did what I could mm. and did it as respectfully as I could. Mm. How did you approach that, Lucy, in terms of telling other people's stories? Yeah, so really, the only stories I told were my own. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been quite an interesting discussion about what is memoir in relation to uh, uh, one of our members of our royal family writing his own <laughs> memoir. And people mm. really kind of scrutinising well, what if your truth is different? And I say that, and I say it in absolutely the reverse of any kind of sense of flippancy, because it was at the start of the process weighing me down. And I have a, what my emergency planning colleagues call a head full of bees. There are always thoughts. They're all over the place. They're going, and I really struggle to order things, and my editorial uh, colleagues need a medal because it's all <laughs> over the place. It's all over the place. It's coming at me. And then I'm like, and that's why I love Twitter. Do you follow me? I tweet through the night. Um, and, and so one thing for me was, it wasn't flowing. There was nothing flowing, but when I spoke, it was there, but it wasn't flowing onto the page. My God, I've taken an advance. Is this ever going to get written? And <laughs> One of the things was that I realised I was weighed down by a hundred rocks of, right, I need to, they've, 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 they've committed me to this, I need to go to the British Library and check that my memory of this is the memory that somebody else has, and I should probably cite it because everybody loves lots of references in a non-fiction <laughs> memoir. And eventually, and it was quite a strong kicking that I got, eventually I got a kicking that was like, write your story. Yeah. We will worry about everything else later. Does it offend? Does it get through the legal read? All of those kind of things. You are suffocating what we've seen in your spark and your words by trying to worry at it from all angles. I worry every single day that somebody will be distressed or that I revealed something that they didn't know or that my language, which is quite... <laughs> Quite, I think one thing that unites all of us is there's some shocking terms in there. There's, we, we need people to know what this was for when they open it in 100 years' time, not right now. Yeah. But I, I am so grateful for that kicking that released me mm. to write. Mm. And um, I, very much you know, like your experience, the, 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 the reception, well, the reception has blown me away. I, I didn't expect it to be mm. received by this mm. and I didn't expect it to be consumed in the way that it has, which mm. has meant the world to me. Mm. Mm. Barker, you, as well as telling your own story, are telling lots of, yeah. you tell them beautifully, individual stories, but there is a responsibility in terms of how you um, position somebody. So if we take the example of, is it Jyoti, who mm -hmm. cycled? Yes. Tell us that story and, and the sort of aftermath of it. Yeah. So I guess my book is some, something in the middle, uh, you know, <laughs> between Joe and Lucy in, in the sense that it's part memoir. It's, it's, it's not only my truth. It's somewhat of my truth. It's a little bit about my life. It's a little bit about my country, my people. Uh, and it's also about a lot of other people. Mm. And therefore, in my writing, consent was very important. Uh, but that doesn't mean, as any writer would know of nonfiction, that when you set out to tell the story of somebody else, they necessarily see their own story like mm -hmm. that. So you approximate it one to the degree that you can. Now, Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti was a 15-year-old girl. So as I was telling you, in the first uh, wave of the pandemic, we had in our country a very, very strict lockdown. And most parts mm -hmm. of the world had a lockdown because initially that was seen to be the, the way to deal with it. And in India, in the first wave, public transport was closed as well. 
So if you were wondering why I referenced the, the, the workers who were walking home, it's because there were no buses, trains, mm -hmm. et cetera, airports or flights to take them home. Uh, Jyoti was a 15-year-old girl who lived with her father in Delhi, and they wanted to go home to the village in Bihar. So you're talking about over a 1,000 kilometers journey. And she, the father had just had a knee surgery. So he was not in a position to walk, certainly, but he couldn't pedal either, and they had one bicycle. So she went, she basically took nine days to take him home, and they would spend the night at gas stations on the highway, out in the open. She was terrified. She was a 15-year-old school girl, and she got him home. And I did, I reported her about three times. One, when she reached home, and she suddenly became this big national headline. Then I went back to her village, and then finally when I was writing for the book. So I got to know her quite well. And what astonished me was that when she reaches her village the first time around, of course it shows her resilience and her courage, and that's enormous, and that's something to, to, to take cognizance of. But I argued, as Ivanka Trump was among those who did kind of tone-deaf tweets about this young girl, that this was not a celebratory moment. This was a deeply traumatic moment for a child. And yes, the child was enormous and she was brave and she was all of those incredible things, but the way to deal with it was not to keep gifting her bicycles, which is what she went through for, for a little bit of period after that. People just kept giving her bicycles. Like when I went to her house, there were just <laughs> dozens of bicycles. And I was like, this is so bizarre, right? So let's not romanticize trauma. <laughs> it's very important to not do that. And, 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 and I asked her, I said, you know, everybody's treating you like a hero, but I want to know what did you think every night when you parked your cycle and you look for a place to sleep? And she said, I'm just a young girl. I thought somebody would do something. I was terrified. I cried every night. And then I said, okay, so what now? And, you know, she was this kind of cause celeb. She was this international headline by then. And her sort of next step was so focused and so small and contained within her universe. And she said, I want to study. She didn't have any grand proclamations. She's being sort of appropriated by everybody as this sort of poster girl of courage. I'm not taking away from her courage. She was incredible. There's now a movie being made on her, and full power to her. I, I, her life transformed a little bit in her village. Her home was the only home to have brick, a brick structure because she became famous, and people started giving money and support, and all that is great. But should she have had to go through this trauma? And how is that trauma going to impact her as she goes forward? She's going to discover that. It's not going to be known to a 15-year-old in, in one go. And so I guess what I'm saying is that even people's version of their own stories changes. Yeah. How they look at events in their life, how Jyoti sees what happened to her at 15, could be very different than how she looks yeah. back at this when she's 25. Mm -hmm. And so the certitude of truth is a very shaky thing, especially in hard times. Mm -hmm. Because you're coming from many different places. Mm -hmm. You're coming from fear, grief, hope, and sometimes you're coming from all of it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let's talk about looking back from a memorial point of view, Lucy. I mean, ritual and memorial, because there are examples within your work of exactly that. And I, I'd like to draw out the difference between the 9-11 memorial and another one that you write about, which perhaps is less familiar, which is, which is based in Quebec. Mm. But within both of those, how important it is for people to be able to either hold on to something or to move on from something. Absolutely, and I think this goes to the heart of what a disaster planner like me is. So a lot of my colleagues work in the early stages of planning for an emergency. And I have found my niche in the immediate afterwards, but trying to bring people and communities back. So you will often see, and again, I found social media a great medium for this, you'll often see me sort of tweeting in protectiveness of people like Jyoti, you know, the, the, um, the hero narrative, for example. Yeah. All the things that we do in those early heady days, uh, what the Red Cross research calls the heroic honeymoon phase, the first 12 weeks, where we offer lambs to the slaughter to be our, our hero narrative, and then we tend to destroy them bluntly. So often somebody will say to me, we've got this great story of this young person, what do you think? And I'm saying, whatever you can do, protect them, pull them back in, 
don't offer them, which can be a challenge because they're very desirable often mm. yeah. in, the, in the media cycle around disaster. And, and, and somebody will tell their story anyway, so then yeah, absolutely. You, know, you have to hope for the most sensitive telling of it, so can yeah. you really protect in this age of absolutely. sort of digital constant information anyone? No. I mean, you can't protect No, anyone. absolutely. And you just, in, in some, some, some of your self-care is to kind of just watch it play out. So one of the things I get very used to doing in the early stages of a disaster response is looking like I really am totally um, outside the mood, I'm misjudging the room, I'm sat there going, I think if you make this decision, you could hold this community back from recovering for the rest of its meaningful life. You will destroy it. And so one of the areas that I get involved in very early on is the care and the management of the, 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 the remains, the deceased. And with 9-11, one of the uh, proclamations made by the, by the president and others was that everything um, would be returned to families, the tiniest of body parts, and that no terrorism DNA would make its way into the mausoleum. And these are one of those great kind of political announcements that you see and the bandwagon jumping that you see in the early days that sort of make sense on paper. They feel like they're probably the right thing to say. And then you look over at the one disaster planner in the room who specializes in recovery, and she's got her head in her hands. So... Uh, with 9-11, what that created was this, what I call in the book, forensic uncertainty. So this massive operation that still runs today to shake and grid tiny, tiny human remains under the custody of the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Unlike all decisions in disaster, there's never any good decisions. You know, that is a lockdown a good decision or a bad decision? Well, actually, we'll never, we can't debate that. There are least worse decisions. And so one of the things that you end up with with um, high uh, energy uh, transportation or terrorism events is a decision to make about the promises that you make to families. And 9-11 uh, was one of my earliest responses, actually based in Britain, sending funeral directors who the day before had been at dinner dances to Ground Zero from Britain to support the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. And there was, a quite, there was a growing consternation about the approach that this did not allow families and communities to rest. Some families had 11 funerals. So one of the things that I had charted throughout my career was the growth of this tension, which was particularly related to the growth of DNA science. And then I saw something very different in Quebec. And it was the first time I'd seen translated into recovery strategies written by the forensic teams that as well as all the other things to identify, to match, they would allow the community to recover. And I had never seen that before. And of course, it's something William is sent to do, is to give the bodies back to Aberfan of their loved ones. That had been a fundamental principle. Actually, it unites us globally. But we sort of lost our way in science and technology. And so I got back from several visits to Lacmagontic, where what had happened was uh, an uncoupled train filled with benzene had, had powered into uh, the town centre. 47 people died. Many people were displaced. And I went on several visits to see if they honoured this. You know, maybe it was just a line in a strategy. And it was through the whole response was that this community would be rested and then it would be able to come gently and slowly back, if it could. Mm. Let's talk about Abavan. Um, both the wonderful way that you write about ritual and memorial within the novel, but, but also how you see Abavan now, having, having researched it. So let's talk about ritual to start with, actually, because when William gets there, you know, in death, ritual is mm. actually... Uh, it's a comfort, isn't it? And he, and he needs to do what he yes. does best. Yes, and actually, you know, in that, that community um, back then, it was massively normal to have the body. If somebody died, you'd have it in your front room and people would come and visit. Um, and what, um, what he, when I spoke to the environment, he said what was different about this disaster from a lot of other disasters is that, of course, all the parents were there. So in other disasters, there might be, you know, horribly mutilated bodies that have to be recognised and put... Whereas 
The parents were waiting in a line to find out if their child had been identified. And there were minors going through the slag heap At the to try to get their those children. children. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was, it was quite unusual. And the most moving thing um, that Billy Dog had told me was that he, you know, they'd, they'd cleaned nearly all the bodies and there was one child <laughs> left to be um, recovered. And he knew that it had been under, under this slurry for quite for two, three or four days. And that the moment air touched the body, mm -hmm. it would start to decompose, and the parents were there. And so Billy Dog had just stood sentinel at the site, waiting for this one body. And the minute it was recovered, he took it, mm -hmm. he carried it, and he bombarded it so then the parents could see it. So just, I mean, the, you know, my <coughs> book's called A Terrible Kindness, and that is what just the absolute sums up what, what he did. Um, but yes, I think that the, the embalmers talked to me about how they, you know, they did their normal process in these extraordinary circumstances and, um, and helped each other in the way that they, they talked to the bodies, they talked to each other. Um, yeah. No, I was just listening to Joe and, and thinking that one of uh, the most moving sets of people that I encountered in my travels across India are those whose job it is to wash bodies yes. uh, before in Hindu custom they're cremated, mm -hmm. but even in Muslim tradition, they're washed before they're buried. And so in both communities, you have actually what are called body washers. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually there is a coincidence between caste and this role. And so you're born into a community where this then becomes your task. And I reported both at cremation grounds and graveyards on these body washers. And what was it, it, it was kind of both simultaneously sad and hopeful because one, it was just this incredible courage because this was still the time in the pandemic when people were scared to touch bodies and there were these young people washing these bodies before they went for their last farewell. But they were still being discriminated against yeah. socially because this was considered an impure thing yeah. to do. And then they were handling bodies that were COVID positive and had died from yeah. COVID. And so there was this sort of dual truth of, of extreme courage and yet and yet that sense of being on the margins of that moment. And I remember one of them saying to me that we are doing what families are not prepared to do for their own. You know, and, and yet this is how we're seen. So I was just listening to yeah. sort of this and I just remember the mm. sort of the the body washers of COVID. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, it's just it, it was just incredible for me to to just stumble upon that. And I, had, in all these years, maybe never even paid attention to the fact, because even before the pandemic, there are people who have washed the bodies, yeah. embalmed the bodies before they set off for their last mm. sort of last rites. And, you know, you'd never stop to think. Yeah. And then this made you think. And there was a, there's a wonderful story that you tell about a, um, a Muslim body washer and a Hindu family, and the father can't face, actually. Yes. Yes, um, it's an incredible. Child. Yeah, I, and that an, is a terrible kindness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Joe, in terms of fiction, because it's not we start in Aberfan, but then we go back, and a lot of it is is set in your home, your now home city yes. of Cambridge. Yes. When you are creating William and his mother Evelyn, and Uncle Robert and others, how? What were you thinking about in terms of these are going? This person is going to be the best character in order to tell this story, his backstory yeah. and the chorister side of things, etc. Yeah. Well, I think um, what happened is I interviewed a second embalmer who had been very young when he'd gone to volunteer. He was only 19 or 20, and he told me how in love he was. He'd just got back from his honeymoon, literally. And so, however awful his memories of the disaster were, he had this, he can't disassociate it with this feeling of being madly in love. Mm -hmm. And so that made me think, what if somebody went with the opposite of that almost? If they went with enormous fracture and loss in their family already, how would that be for them? That's what sort of interested me and pulled me. And, and then the Cambridge chorister boy bit. I think I've just lived in Cambridge for a long time, have really enjoyed observing these quaint little boys and now girls who, who walk around with their strange old fashioned outfits and do these astonishing performances in front of an international audience. And they just stand up and do it like it's nothing. And I was all the storyteller in teller in me always thought what if it went really wrong <laughs> what if it went desperately wrong and quite quickly I just came upon the idea that if if I could let something happen to him when he was there in the context of this college um, setting which I thought I would enjoy writing about about Cambridge about the college about the beautiful music but if that could be where something 
terribly difficult happens to him. That's what he can carry into when he goes to have a van. So it's sort of circumstantial, really, and it took a bit of weaving together. But I, I felt, and it also served my purpose as well because music is very important to the people in the Welsh valleys. They're brilliant singers, and their music seems means so much. And the fathers of Aberfan said, we don't know how to cry like the women do, but we know how to sing, and they've sung all over the world. So I knew there was an opportunity to thread those um, threads together. There is also an, an element in, in William, and perhaps I think disaster um, more generally, as people come to think, you think about this as well, um, about finding beauty and actually that being a through way. And he finds beauty in the singing, he finds beauty in art as well, actually, doesn't he? Yes, yes, he's, he's really sensitive to that. And he's, and yes, and when, um, when the, the, the thing that happens to him in the college, he makes him cut music out of his life. He can't bear to hear it, to think about it. It's a bit like you were saying about, it reminds you of your dad, Buck, yeah. and he can't mm. bear it. So, but, but yeah. basically he shuts off his own life by doing that. And so, um, so but he does, he does connect with art when he's starting to train as an embalmer and he doesn't know what to do with himself at the weekend, so he goes and looks at the art galleries and, and it feeds him. And so I wanted to make him this person who's obviously fed by culture and art, mm. but he's cut this sort of limb off, really. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, ultimately he finds his way back to that through helping with a choir for the homeless. Mm. Um, and it's this thing about art and culture um, feeding our humanity, whatever our circumstances and situation. Yeah. And helping so, other people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Lucy, there is, there is that, you know, um, the, when people are bereaved, there is that, there are coping mechanisms. Some, yeah. For some people, it's the practicalities and the, I've got to be busy. And then perhaps it moves through to the solace of something bigger and um, I'm a small person in this yeah. big world, yeah? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and just actually to, to meld the two together, picking up from what Barker said, you know, our, our death and body washers were treated the same in the UK. You know, so we give them grand titles, they're anatomical pathology technologists. Mm -hmm. But, for example, they often are not employed by the NHS, so they weren't entitled to any of the perks that the National Health Service did. And many of them uh, lived away from home and slept at the mortuary because they were scared of bringing the disease home. Yeah. So one of the things, I think, is there's a danger of framing all of this as, as um, you know, the, and I obviously speak from a UK-centric position sometimes, we don't think we have the same lessons to learn. You know, one of the points I've been yeah, tweeting yeah. since 6 o'clock this morning is how relevant your book is to our learning in the UK. Um, for me, I think there is a, there's, a, there's a terrible... Uh, expectation that, that terrible things will come with a, with a huge price, and sometimes they, they do, mm -hmm. but I think there is a spectrum of things that bring comfort, and that was the other thing about putting so much of me in the book, <laughs> is, um, and also simultaneously going above the parapet, I haven't, I haven't worked above the parapet until I, the book came out, um, you know, I'm security cleared, I'm normally in the back corridors, and then suddenly I had a Twitter profile and I was yeah. doing things, was because I wanted people to understand that this work doesn't have to be horrifying, it is the greatest privilege yeah. of my life. And that most of my colleagues feel the same. We strongly identify with William, I think. And sometimes we do have colleagues who go into the field of working with people at the worst time of their lives who already come with fractures. And those fractures are incredibly hard to, to manage. But there are other things that I think help us celebrate and process. Anybody who's seen me enjoying this festival <laughs> this week will know. I think no, everything, no. Every, you know, I live differently. I, taste food differently, I laugh differently. And actually, you know, I, with the embalmers and the funeral directors that I spend a lot of time with, life is lived. And that was brought home to me. And actually, I've, I'm, I've had to do my eye makeup twice. I've been reading your book this morning and last night. And I, I actually read Prince Harry's book yesterday. And he talks about the battle rap. And that's a very tight film that you put over wounds, ideally to save people. So when he's in Afghanistan. And it was a memory that I was there somewhere, but I'd blocked out. And usually you'd hope that it would save yeah. the person. But if it didn't, it was, I, I worked in the Bryce Norton mortuary, and it was my colleague's job to cut down the side of it. And all of a sudden, here in this beautiful festival, I suddenly remembered the noise. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things is about working in this kind of field and also seeing that some of the worst trauma we see is in journalists. Yeah. As you, you know, I smiled, Riley, when you said pushing the trauma down the road. Yeah. But the journalist trauma is some of the most distressing we see because you, you, you see it and you take it all in. Mm. Is that one of the things is to have this really 
big, broad basket of things that you can draw on. And that is everything from music. Mine is slightly, slightly hardcore compared to William's, a bit more, bit more rap and hip hop. <laughs> but at this end, or it might be the show tunes of a musical or some heavy rock. Um, the sun will come yeah, out tomorrow. Or, yeah, <laughs> enjoying life, loving. I'm very, very lucky to have a, a very supportive family. I hope so. I don't know what they're doing at the moment, but I think they're supportive. <laughs> All the way through, which is really important and difficult to, in some cultures, I think, is I, I, I grew up with my career at the time where America had really exported psychological debriefing for responders, <laughs> which William didn't get. Mm. And you don't have to be traumatized either as a recipient of disaster, so experiencing it today, or bereavement or trauma, or as a responder. Mm. And that has been hugely important to me. Let's talk about debriefing after you've written the novel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, during the novel. I mean, what effect has it had on you personally as you were writing it and also as you're taking it out and sharing it in the world? Yeah, I think when I was... The, the most emotionally difficult bit was when I was listening to the embalmers telling me their stories. I mean, that was really hard, just not to howl as they were talking. And then I got very... When I was actually writing it, it was quite forensic. I just thought, my job is to really capture the essence of what they told me. And I didn't feel... I was, it was a, you know, it was a head thing, just trying to capture it and get it down as well as I could. Um, and then once the book was finished and it was out there and the, the, the sort of promotion work was starting, then it was fear, because I thought, <laughs> what if I have upset people or offended them? It's too late now. <laughs> it's out there. Um, and I had a lot of support from my publisher, and actually Lucy was really, really helpful as well. Um, but it, it, but it, it was very nerve-wracking. On the whole, it's been received very well, and the people of Wales have been wonderful, and it's actually Book of the Month in Wales at the moment, so that, that was heartening. But like you said, there's always a fear that there's somebody who, who may be upset. I have met a survivor, and she, she said, like, she bought my book, she said, I don't think I can read it, but I like the spirit you've written it in, so... So that was a relief. <laughs> and now you're about to hand it on to other people to do something with because you've got a TV deal for yes, it. Yes, yes. So how does that feel that you're letting go of it? Yeah, well, I think it feels great in that I have big respect for the production company that are doing it. If, if it was sort of a, sort of a you know, backstreet, dodgy <laughs> outfit, but I have such trust for them and they've talked to me about their vision for it and it feels so um, solid and respectfully the original and I do get to approve each episode um, but I didn't want to write the script I was quite happy I said to them it's taken me nearly 20 years to write the novel I think I'll leave the script to you <laughs> um, and so I'm really happy for that I'm looking forward to working collaboratively with them on it I mean having said that if something if I'm not happy with it that would be really difficult but I feel I trust them to, to yeah. get the essence of it good good um, I wonder whether we might get the microphones out, please, if there's questions straight away. Oh, there's lots of questions. Let's have a... Um, I think... Uh, tell you what, have you got a mic? Let's start with you, and then we'll get another microphone here in the third row, please. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi. I, one of the most horrifying things that I've seen recently um, was uh, there was an um, aeroplane crash in Peru about two months ago with a fire truck on the, on the runway. And... Um, someone, having got off the aeroplane, took a selfie in front of the burning wreckage of the aircraft. Um, and, you know, that, I, I found that from a human point of view horrific, that that would be your first reaction to having survived um, an event that other people didn't survive. So my question is, how do you feel that social media has um, affected... Uh, people's response to disaster, but also the healing or the lack of healing that social media has um, on people who've survived a disaster? Lucy, do you want to put that up first? Yeah, and it's a brilliant <laughs> question. Thank you very much. And actually, I think my response is sometimes a bit of a surprise because the first chapter in the book is how I got involved in disaster, which is a child of a community reeling from not just the disaster itse itself, the Hillsborough disaster, but the state denial of what happened. So I think a lot of people will always expect me to condemn the use of, of cell phones. I'd like you to move out the way while we're putting the fire out, ideally. Yeah. And I'm very keen about things like dignity. But I actually would never, ever go back to a time when somebody cannot say, I was there, you did that to me. It has fundamentally changed how people think about their response. And that, for me, is actually... A good thing. So I, I'm, I'm really ambivalent as a planner. We get worried about it too, like you do. And sometimes you just can't believe it. And certainly if people aren't coming to help, which we've seen. We've seen people take pictures but not call yeah. an ambulance. But for me, the difference it's made to citizen journal 
them has changed my career completely. I'm very grateful for it. No, I, I actually agree. Uh, I, I know that, you know, probably the expected responses are how, how revolting. Uh, but I think one thing these two years of reporting the pandemic taught me is that people do not want to be invisible. And mm -hmm. there's this sense of in a large power structure of yeah. your being very small. Something very big has happened of you being yeah. small. And that selfie or that moment is a way yeah. of you chronicling your reality in the worry or the insecurity that nobody else might. So the instinct is to be judgy about it. And I get that instinct, but I have to stop myself and say, no, you know what? People could say that about journalists. Why are you there <laughs> taking pictures? So many times when the workers were walking, I would get these weird tweets saying, why are you reporting on them instead of making them sit in your car and driving with them? And I'm like, okay, firstly, we're four people in a car, there are no seats. Secondly, there are millions of workers walking. My job is to shine a light on that yeah. story so structurally something changes. Yeah. And so there's always this instinct to judge the image capturer. Yeah. But that image capturer is either capturing that image for their own place of acknowledgement, the need to be acknowledged, and often in despairing times, you'll be shocked as a journalist, people want to talk. You know, the viewer will say, why did you talk to that person in a moment of grief? And I'm saying, as long as it was with consent, the agency belongs to that family. And I think that feeling comes from not wanting to be invisible yes. in the annals of history. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, question here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, both, uh, Baka, Joe, and Lucy for sharing uh, your personal experiences and the insight. My, I have two questions. The first uh, uh, for Burka, how does uh, such an unfortunate personal loss and the pandemic, you know, it went, uh, which uh, across the world everybody has faced, change you as a person, uh, personally, professionally, socially, emotionally? Okay, and the second question and, as and well? The second question is uh, for Joe and Lucy is, do you really think pandemic itself is a metamorphosis for a humankind? Okay, right, Barker, off you go. Um, I think the changes are big but manifest themselves in very small mm. ways. Music was, is a big problem for me. I love music. My father used to sit at his computer, uh, you know, listening to internet radio the whole day. And so every song, the opening chords of a song can sometimes make me cry. And you know, he, he, I know his favorite songs and sometimes they'll play in a restaurant I'm at and suddenly I can't talk and I can't focus on the food. And you know, I'm trained enough that I can talk. Only I know what's happening to me, but it's happening to me inside. Um, socially, I'm a gregarious person, but sometimes now I feel like, oh, this is all so meaningless. I don't really want to talk to people unless I really connect to them. So there's that emotional impatience uh, that has come into me. And professionally, actually, I just feel like, and I say this in the book, that as a journalist of now 23, 24 years, I think I've realized how far we were from our readers and viewers in what we thought was important in our mm. newsrooms, mm. right? Um, we are obsessed, when I say we, I mean there's a certain sort of, you know, kind of journalist uh, obsessed with politics, our government's following, who's winning, who's going to be the next prime minister, who's going to be the next president, et cetera. And I'm not saying that doesn't have its own place in the news cycle, but that dissonance between what people go through every day, what they want to see in, in the content they're consuming and the stories we're telling. I think professionally, somehow this bleakest period of, you know, otherwise has made me a better journalist. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's an odd thing, but I would say that. So in fact, as Thank as you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Let, the the <laughs> Thank you. So, COVID as a metamorphosis. No, <laughs> I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. To be honest, um, had, but, I guess has humanity sort of changed as a as a as a result? I think it's more a Lucy question. To be fair, I might, it's yeah, a Lucy you go question. First. <laughs> Thank you. At an individual level, probably yeah. briefly, yes. But I think we try and reach too, mu too much for the idea that it will fundamentally change us. Right now, it seems right that it does. But actually, history shows that we, we forget very quickly. And I talk about in the book, there is a purpose to forgetting, which is why all three books 
absolutely yeah. need to exist, whether you, can, whether you can read them now or later, or whether intergenerationally people come back to them. Um, you know, the idea that people read from literature in, in 200 years' time. So to understand, to write a pandemic plan, which I've been writing since 2004, very little of it was followed, but I still put my effort in. Um, I read novels from 1918. And that's what people mm. will do with both literature, mm. with both fiction and non-fiction. So for me, they will forget. We will fall back into ways. We will mm. tell each other that we will be different. We will live with a new acuity. But actually, every bit of history teaches us we won't, except for a few of us. Some of us disaster planners never forget. We never, ever leave on a fight <laughs> because we never forget how precious life is. I think what has changed, I think the, me the change in the media is enduring. Yeah. And, and one thing I would say, I remember, because there's so much noise in those early days of Twitter uh, in the pandemic, and your tweets cut through everything else. I've actually followed you well before oh, even the book was, you. my book or She's yours. She's a fan girl. Huge oh. fan girl. But the reason it did was suddenly somebody was going to, to say what was Im important. And I think that forensic eye might stay. I hope it will, as long as there are people like Barker. Oh, okay. thank you. And people oh, yes. like Joe writing fiction. Well, thank Without you. I will just quickly add, though, that yeah. there's a discussion now. Is it too soon to be writing novels about what happened? And there is one I've read by Sarah Hall, Burnt Coach, I think it's called, and it really made me think, Oh my goodness, we have gone through such a big yeah. thing. Yeah. You, you, just seeing it set in this story, just never yeah. me to, because yeah. it's a bit like when you're in a war, you just get on with it. Yeah. You get on with it and you get by, and it's not until afterwards you can think, yeah. that's yeah. really had an impact. Yeah. So I think there will be a read, as, as you've said, it'll be a really good place for novels about this, but it's very, it is quite soon to write them, I think, for most people. Okay, there's a question I, here with um, the mic. I have can a can question for. Mic around here? Just one second. Another mic. Sorry, yeah, here. I have a question for Barker. First of all, Varka, you really, really have brought the, 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 the art of storytelling into journalism, mm -hmm. which we had not seen in India for a long time. Yeah. But, you know, it also poses a question and a dilemma between that uh, detached yeah. objectivity and, you know, the intimate subjectivity. I was a journalist. I, I have been, I'm still a student of journalism. We have been always told that there is a, that objectivity and subjectivity debate. How have been you able to to cope with that, and I have seen your pieces on Kashmir long time back. You became part of the story. You were inside the frame as well. So have you been able to negotiate that uh, that debate or that yeah, discourse it's a great on question, subject actually. objectivity? I, 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 it's a great question, and I have to say, at least during the pandemic, I gave up on any pretense <laughs> that I was a detached product. <laughs> I actually do not remember any story in my life other than reporting politics where I feel no emotion. There's no other story that I've reported where I. Uh, don't feel and I can't help bringing my feelings yeah. into it. What that does is it creates a very polarizing response from the audience because some people don't like it. They want you to be five steps removed. I don't have that personality and I can't act. I'm not an actor. So I'm just myself. And so in COVID, I have hugged people. <laughs> they have held me and wept. I have wept with them. Uh, you know, uh, there was a a child I interviewed whose father was a government school teacher and he had to go on election duty and he died from COVID and she said to me, you must know what I feel. You lost your father too. She was 15, I'm 50. And I said, yes, but my father did not have to go, you know, on an assignment. That's not how he got COVID and yours did and you're 15 and I'm 50. And suddenly I was weeping while talking. I was just <laughs> weeping while I was talking to her and the camera was on and I didn't edit anything out. I was just, like, it happened. It's. Uh, you know, too often, I think, as journalists, uh, we pretend that we are in some sanitized, perfectly <laughs> efficient, robotic universe. Even, forget non, forget pandemic times. Sometimes I can stumble. I can forget a word. I may not remember a point of research. There's this sort of manicured expectation that I'm going to be perfect. My hair will not be out of place. I will remember everything. I always say, it's okay to say, I don't know. Oh my God, I forgot. Oh, I stumbled. Oops. So from that to just carrying my emotion into my work, I, I think there's certain things that are larger than us. And what your audience, your reader needs to actually experience is that you're feeling what they're feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, it's emotional honesty. I, what, I, what about the editorial no, hold, compulsions? No, 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 thank you. Sorry. Because it's uh, related lots to the of question. questions. <laughs> sorry, I could not get an answer to my question. Sorry. No. What were the editorial compulsions? Sir, None. Uh, I'm my own boss. I have <laughs> okay, editorial yeah. Compulsions. Let's thank hear you. from you, please, in the second row. Yeah, you? Yeah. 
please. Oh, hi, um, my question is for Barkha. Uh, in terms of Mojo stories, what are you planning to do differently after all these experiences? Mm -hmm. And do you hire differently? What do you look for in journalists now? Are you looking for a job? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good girl. Shamelessly I, asking. No, I look for passion. Mm -hmm. um, I think too many people join journalism because they think it's glamorous, <laughs> uh, because they want their face on camera. Um, too many people also join it thinking it's another regular job. And I always tell people that it's not. This is, it, I'm not trying to make, be self-important, but if you do not feel absolutely passionate about telling the stories of other people, sometimes in very trying circumstances, this is not the profession for you. In fact, you'll hate it. <laughs> and there are people who come into it and yeah. hate it. And to that extent, what I look for in journalists before and after has not changed. I actually think I lost some touch with my own passion and reporting yeah. out there helped me rediscover it. So it's just about remembering who you are. And I think I look for authenticity. I think people want to see, it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, it, none of this matters. What matters is do you feel real to them? And so it's very important for me to look for authenticity, curiosity and passion. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, my question is also for Barkha. Um, I know you've, you know, we've we've seen all your reporting from Cargill right up to COVID, and of course your personal loss. I really want to know how you processed the grief, and not just your personal grief, but seeing so much on the ground, the mental health. I want to know if you took time out to uh, uh, to prioritize your mental health, and is that something you would sort of want to uh, advocate for the rest of the journalists as well? Thank you. So my sister went to a professional grief counselor, though she was not reporting pandemic after my father died. And my friends have been urging me to go to one and I keep avoiding it, though I'm perfectly aware that it should be done. <laughs> May I say that my not doing it is as they say, don't do this at home. Uh, I am not an example of anything healthy you should emulate when it comes to mental health. Uh, I feel like I'm smarter than any therapist I'm going to speak to. <laughs> And, and more self-aware, and I've already <laughs> thought of this. And, but this is all wrong. And you know, everybody <laughs> needs is. help, right? Everybody needs everybody help. Everybody needs help. Uh, I think that I have not yet reached that point where I'm willing to open that, that sheet that Lucy spoke about. Because it is, you know, you've got to rip off the bandage and you've got to feel, and I don't feel ready to feel as fully as that process would need. But I know that I need to do it. So... I'm, I, I'm saying that please, if you're feeling, yeah. you know, that you can't share something with someone, you're going through something internally where you feel alone. Grief, the toughest thing about grief is that it's hugely isolating. The world moves on and you feel you've been left behind. And I know so many people feel that for different reasons. Yeah. Please seek help. I am not the example <laughs> you should follow. But sometimes it's easier to conceal it rather than... But it'll catch up, right? Yeah. yeah. It catches yeah. up. Yeah. Well, I think Lucy can speak to that, but I would say it eats you up somewhere. Yeah. You know, you can carry on, but like somewhere you, you can't sleep. Suddenly like you can't sleep. Yeah. Suddenly you don't want to eat or you're eating too much or suddenly you want to do strange things. <laughs> you know, your impulse management completely goes yeah. for a toss. Basically. Yeah. I have to say there have been some very wise words <laughs> spoken and none, none more than that. There are some also some very, very wise words in these three books and I would highly commend them to you. There is something special, actually, I've found in reading these three books together and taking out different things, the parallels, the differences and, and the similarities. Um, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to say thank you to Dipti and uh, the room team. Thank you to the wonderful volunteers. Um, thank you to Emirates Airline, Dubai Culture, Emirates Literature Foundation and the session sponsor, Dubai Duty Free. But most of all, thank you to these three wonderful women, thank Barker, you. Lucy and Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.